Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome for coming to this second seminar in the Water Left series. This is a mini series set in the seed seminars of our political policy program. Uh, uh, because Richard and Niji are teaching the core course of political ecology development this year, and that's uh, what we, in that context, we uh, organize a similar series. This water part is uh, uh, done in collaboration with the Center for Water and Development, or that was Karen this year, and he was heading that. And then, because I happen to be at the London International Development Center, I will also put that label on it. So it sounds very grand. Uh, and, uh, I'm happy to have uh, you here in the room. Uh, today's speaker is Nadine, Dr. Nadine Reis. Uh, she works at the, in, at the Geography Department at the University of Bonn, uh, has done long standing for a long time field work in Mexico. She's spoken here and so on before on art on illegal water markets, which is also part of the talk today, but now set more in the context of a broader development perspective related to financialization in the housing sector. You will hear all about it. So uh, uh, I know it's very interesting work, uh, very detailed field work, so uh, I hope you'll have many questions. Also, even beyond and uh, in connection with the paper, so that the floor is now first. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Uh, yeah, welcome everyone. I'm happy that so many of you are interested in this topic, finance and water. Um, I've been doing research in Mexico for quite a while, um, 12 years, 13 years, um, starting with my master's. And uh, for my PhD, I actually went to Vietnam, which is another story. Uh, but then I went back to Mexico um, and I uh, have a project at the moment that's actually about land and land control, um, but also always following up uh, the whole water. Um, issues. Um, and of course, uh, finance, uh, which is the main topic uh, at the moment. Uh, so this uh, presentation is based on several stays uh, in the field um, um, over uh, the course of the last years. Um, and um, yeah, since um, since uh, 2012, I've had several stays in the field. Last year, I stayed uh, for um, half a year. And um, I'm going to talk about water and finance today because I realized uh, more and more, the more research I did there, that um, you can't actually understand anything that's going on in Mexico without uh, looking at finance. Uh, so that's why I started uh, getting into this uh, topic. So um, my, um, in, my, in my presentation today, which is largely based on a paper for globalizations, um, and also on an earlier one in water, water Alternatives that I think some of you um, know, that we've discussed with some people here before. Um, my aim is to explore how natural resource regimes, um, and here the focus is on water, uh, interact with an accumulation model that is led by finance capital. And my main argument will be that finance capitalism is a social ecological process coming along with a shift in control of our water resources in Mexico. However, it's not so much a direct uh, form of taking over control, such as water grabbing, uh, but rather it's a control shift that works through more complex causalities. And I think that um, Jason Moore's concept of the web of life could be um, a nice way of grasping this um, more complex set of causalities that are at work here. The argument is based on the case of the interaction of the financialized housing sector and water um, in my study region um, in Mexico that I'm going to introduce to you in a moment. So after the introduction of uh, the study area, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, financialization of the housing sector and show how housing policy serves as a mechanism for the redistribution of wealth from uh, the working class in Mexico to globalized finance capital. Um, I'm then uh, going to talk about the role of water in this process, and I will show first how housing projects come into being through an existing water governance regime, and how this has led to new structures of access to uh, water with uh, far-reaching social and ecological implications. 
Finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about the financialization of the Mexican economy um, at large, which is something I've been um, engaged with, uh, with over the last um, month, um, and explore a little bit what may be the further implications of this in terms of water. So my research area is the Toluca Valley. Um, Toluca is the capital of the state of Mexico. It's the Estado de Mexico, which is the state that surrounds uh, the federal district of, of Mexico City. Um, and um, this, uh, this area has been uh, characterized by fast development since about the 1970s. And uh, this development took off in, uh, with, the, with the earthquake in uh, 85 uh, in Mexico City, when a lot of industry moved from Mexico to Toluca. And especially then in the 1990s, of course, with NAFTA, when a lot of um, industrial parks were set up in this area. So there's been development in the sense of industrialization and a transition away from agriculture, uh, go along, along with urbanization and high population growth. This is the city of Toluca. Uh, it has about two and a half million inhabitants now. In the last uh, two decades, the valley has seen a process of vast territorial expansion and urban sprawl, especially since 2000. As you can see on this map, there's been a massive uh, increase of dispersed settlement. These are all the red zones. Uh, you can see on, on the map is red spots in the periphery of the city. What has happened there? Uh, the growth of the dispersed settlements in the periphery of the city in the last uh, 15 years is mainly due to this phenomenon. Um, these are huge housing colonies constructed by private real estate uh, investors called uh, Conjuntos Urbanos. And uh, these uh, investors construct uh, 10,000 houses um, at once, up to 10,000 houses. Not all of them are, are that big, but there are uh, colonies that are that size. Um, between 1999 and 2014, the government of the state of Mexico authorized the uh, construction of almost 500 colonies. That is a total of 730,000 houses that um, were constructed in the surroundings uh, of Mexico City. All of this goes back to the financialization of housing policy uh, in the course of the neoliberal restructuring of the country. So in the 1990s, the Mexican government introduced a policy reform, which implied that the government completely withdrew from uh, the involvement, from the direct involvement in construction of social housing and instead took over the role of a mortgage lender for the working class. And a major part of this reform was the inclusion of private real estate developers into the construction of low-cost housing. And the real boom of this started uh, in 2000 with uh, the creation of the federal mortgage company, the uh, Sociedad Hipotecaria Federal, as it's called in Mexico, um, which uh, was mainly financed by, uh, uh, with a loan from the World Bank, which is actually the largest loan that Mexico ever got from the World Bank that was used for uh, creating or setting up uh, this federal mortgage company. And um, what it does or what it helps the Mexican state to do is to securitize these mortgages, to, to pack these mortgages into, into packages and sell them off uh, in, in portfolios to international investors. And the consequence of this was the mushrooming of, of low quality housing colonies in the surrounding of Mexico's uh, large cities. So not only in the Mexico City area, but also in the north or more to the south um, of the country. But particularly, um, of course, in the, in the state of Mexico, where a lot of population is concentrated. What you see here is a, a simplified model of this um, housing uh, financing in Mexico. Um, the uh, main funding agency is called Infonavit. Um, it has about 70% uh, uh, of the whole mortgage market in Mexico. Infonavit uh, is a national housing fund where all workers that are formerly employed in companies in Mexico uh, save automatically 5% of their salary into a fund. And out of this fund, uh, they can uh, take a um, mortgage uh, to buy a house. But actually, the only houses that are avail available 
are the houses that are uh, in these colonies that are um, that are uh, uh, constructed by these by these private uh, companies. And Infonavit has issued uh, more than eight million credits in Mexico. Uh, up to 2014, I think, is the data. The great majority uh, since 2000, so in like 14 um, years. It's the largest mortgage lender in Latin America and the fourth largest in America. Mortgages are also financed through the so-called SOFOLES and SOFOMES. These are private bank entities that are run by private banks um, like uh, Santander or banks um, active in Mexico or the real estate companies um, themselves. And, um, oh, and these were also created with the funds uh, from the federal mortgage uh, company, uh, this government institution. Um, now, both mortgages from Sofoles and from the national housing funds are sold to international investors. Um, as the government states, uh, to increase uh, the funding for housing that's available. And these mortgages, they've been highly attractive for investors because, uh, first of all, the default risk is completely taken over by the state uh, through this uh, federal mortgage company, uh, through state guarantees to investors. Then uh, these uh, mortgages, they have uh, until recently um, been inflation adjusted. so. Uh, this means um, a yearly automatic increase of the mortgage principal with the inflation rate. And at the moment, um, there's an, uh, also a high interest rate, which is now at uh, 12%. So this means that you basically could not lose as an investor in this, um, in this whole uh, project, in this story. In 2013, uh, the party was over, was what one uh, agent of uh, one of the big real estate companies uh, said to me. There was a big uh, crash in the market where three of the four big um, real estate companies went bankrupt and which was caused by excessive numbers of people abandoning their houses. Uh, the companies not being able to sell all the houses that they had constructed already without, um, uh, yeah, without selling them uh, before or having the guarantee that they could sell them and the investors in turn withdrawing their money. Um, there are different ciphers of empty and abandoned houses. They vary between two and five million in Mexico. Um, this um, includes the houses that were finished and not sold or um, the left unfinished uh, due to the bankruptcy of the developers. The main reasons for why the people left were the remote location of these colonies, as you saw on the map in the outskirts of the city, without uh, public transport, without public infrastructure, uh, also the poor construction quality of the houses. The houses were uh, partly, as I saw this, they were constructed in, uh, in flood, uh, flooding areas, for example, and people that come from other um, from other regions in Mexico don't know that this is an area that's usually flooded every year, um, or this, this kind of stories. So, um, oh, and also lo loss of employment was of course a factor in this. Um, the end of the game was that um, the, uh, the borrowers and the state um, were the losers in this. Um, Hundreds of thousands of people, they remain indebted. Uh, while they've lost their houses and the non-performing loans, they were left with the federal mortgage company, uh, which is the state, uh, which uh, remains with a debt of more than two billion uh, US dollars out of this. So I think that this story in itself is already worth uh, being told, but um, the question that I want to turn to now is how this form of accumulation actually materializes on the ground how it happens locally. And what I'm, uh, what I'm gonna argue is that water and the actors controlling it play an essential role in it. This is because um, the um, local materialization of uh, financialized accumulation is also dependent on material resources such as, as land and water. And it's those actors that are in control of or that are able to gain control over water that are able to appropriate um, these newly available resources at the local level. And also through the access to water rights that they have shape um, how finance capital spatially materializes. 
And this um, process has led to new structures of access to water that persist um, up to now, as I'm going to um, show you. So finally, we come to water. Uh, I guess many of you here are interested in, in, in water. Um, so um, this is the aquifer of the uh, Valle de Toluca. Um, and um, groundwater is, is the most important, or basically the water source uh, in this area, since it's a semi-arid area. And on this uh, map, you see the limits of the aquifer and the points of water extraction. This is a map that was made by a project by the uh, German Development Corporation in 2004, when I did my internship there as a student. Uh, the, the idea of this project was to um, counter groundwater over extraction by setting up a participatory uh, groundwater management uh, council committee. And uh, I guess, yeah, you might be able to, uh, to, to get an idea after I explained the, how this illegal water rights market uh, emerged, why this project was not uh, successful in the end. So this valley um, of Toluca belongs to the highly overexploited aquifers um, in Mexico. And the groundwater tables have been falling. Uh, the wells have now an average depth of around 200 meters. And in the industrial zone, uh, in the center of the valley, there aren't 600 meters uh, deep. The new wells are, are 600 um, meters deep. In Mexico, um, water is by constitution a uh, property of the nation managed by the National Water Commission, CONAGUA. Uh, with the water law reform in 1992, the government introduced a system of private water rights concessions in so-called prohibition zones, uh, Zona Seveda, uh, which was in 2012 around 55% uh, uh, of the country. These are all the colored areas uh, on this map. At the white zones are free access zones where anyone is free to drill a well um, and extract water. In prohibition zones, uh, while water is uh, of course still considered a common good, uh, there's now a system of water titles that allows registered users to extract a certain volume of cubic meters per year. So this implies that there are no new concessions anymore. Um, but um, um, yeah, there are no new concessions anymore since this regularization process was finished uh, in the end of the 1990s. So it means that if you want the right to extract water from the aquifer, the only way to get it is via a transmission of rights from someone who sees his rights in, in this same aquifer. And since water is a common good, these water rights transmissions are in principle free and only involve a service fee to be paid to um, the National Water Commission. So uh, what does this mean for a real estate developer who wants to construct a new colony? Um, because of the high population growth, uh, public water utilities in the Tulunca Valley, they operate at the limit of their concessions already and they cannot supply the new inhabitants of these colonies with, um, with their existing uh, volumes that they have. So this is why the municipalities, before they issue a construction permit to the real estate developers, they uh, request a water concession uh, from them for the volume that is necessary, will be necessary to serve the future inhabitants of this colony. And uh, this uh, fact has created uh, massive demand uh, for water rights concessions by the housing construction sector and it's uh, led in turn to the emergence of an illegal um, market for water rights which is quite um, profitable this is what what is uh, turned over in, in what can be turned over in, in such a, a transaction so on this black market um, as the locals call it, El Mercado Negro, uh, there's a handful of brokers, uh, locally called coyotes, who manage and control these water rights transmissions. My, my study is uh, largely based on the Toluca Valley, but I know from my interview data that these illegal market structures also exist in other regions of um, Mexico. How does the illegal market work? 
The um, central actor is the uh, coyote. Um, actually, I found I, I used to think that the coyotes they were all male, but I just uh, found last year that's also a female uh, one. Unfortunately, she was not um, willing to talk to me, but maybe next time I hope so. <laughs> um, so this is um, this this intermediary that has the necessary knowledge, um, like uh, law about uh, water law, for example, um, has the social networks. Um, and also the experience um, with, with, uh, in dealing with the Water Commission uh, to be able to function as a broker between the people uh, that um, want to cede water rights and uh, the people that need water rights. And at the same time, he can make this process, through these abilities that he has, he can make this process look like uh, a non-monetary ceding while actually payments are made. So what do you do um, if you need water rights? The first thing, of course, is uh, you may have social networks, you may know people uh, from other uh, businesses that um, have gone through this process before, and um, you can ask them um, how to manage the situation. If you don't know the area, um, you're new to the whole thing, you may go to the local water utility or to the water commission and ask uh, for a water concession for a new plant where they will tell you that, that there, there are no uh, new water concessions, but um, they may give you the contact um, of someone who can help you um, with this problem. And the person that um, hands out the right business card in this uh, situation will later receive a commission for establishing the contact from, from this coyote. Then um, you call the coyote um, to ask uh, for, for the rights uh, you need uh, for his service. What does the coyote do? How does he get um, this uh, water rights that you request um, from him? First option is, he's himself the representative of someone uh, willing to cede rights. Uh, for example, he's employed as a water manager uh, for a company that has improved its water efficiency um, and has uh, surplus volumes that uh, they, they want to sell on the market. The second and the most common way is um, to draw on so-called promotores. Um, so most users uh, who are willing to seed rights um, up to now have been farmers, although um, I have to say that this is up to like when I did the research about uh, three years ago, I think that this is slowly um, changing now, because there are less and less farmers that have so, uh, so many, so, such high volumes of water rights. But the point is that for farmers which, with a large land holdings under irrigation, the creation of this water rights uh, system was, uh, uh, turned their wells into gold mines. So promotores, they are people who go uh, to the farmers and ask around, who, uh, who wants to sell uh, parts, uh, part of their rights and how much uh, they want, to it, want for it. And once this uh, deal is done, uh, these agents uh, will get a share of the final price of the volume uh, that was transferred. In the next step, the coyote is then uh, managing up there, Conagua, all the uh, formalities of the transition uh, with the Water Commission, which is a very uh, complex and uh, difficult uh, process. We need a lot of experience and knowledge um, and uh, about law, water law, and especially what you need is uh, social, um, yeah, this kind of social capital to, to know how to deal <laughs> with uh, the higher level officials that, um, that have the power to authorize these transmissions. That is to say, that uh, corruption payments are necessary to get uh, these transmissions authorized. When the transmission is authorized, the new user gets his water title uh, from Conagua. And uh, finally, all compensations are paid. One cubic meter is now 35 pesos, which is now allowed around 1 euro 60. It used to be a lot more two or three years ago. Uh, but it's uh, still quite a lot, just to give you um, an idea. Uh, one, one cubic meter is about one, 160, and rights transmissions uh, usually involve volumes of several hundred thousand up to one or 1 1.5 million cubic meters. 
right? So uh, yeah, you can imagine that this is a business that creates consider considerable profits for the brokers and all those involved in the process, including the, um, the state uh, bureaucrats. Oh yeah, one of the officer of Conagua told me that water is now more expensive than oil. So to summarize this up to now, financialization of housing has significantly contributed to the emergence of an illegal water rights market. This market is now a defining characteristic of the water rights uh, allocation regime in Toluca and most, li um, most likely elsewhere in Mexico. This market is determined by a powerful network of actors who benefit from water rights trading. This includes the um, intermediaries, the water users selling surplus rights, and a senior and lower level staff in the water uh, bureaucracy. This is uh, the interest of those uh, that's also implicated within um, the state apparatus. What are the implications of this? Um, first, in uh, contrast to the uh, original aim of the 1992 water law that introduced individual titling to counter groundwater over extraction, this is not the case because of the enormous economic interests associated with illegal water rights trading. This means that for um, water rights to function for ecological sustainability, uh, regulations would have to be in place that allow the absorption of surplus rights for the restoration of the aquifer. Right, so um, for this to make any sense for ecological sustainability, um, you have to cancel a part part of the rights uh, that are that are issued. The thing is that the water law in Mexico actually does foresee uh, such a mechanism called caducidad, uh, meaning the expiring of titles uh, for water volumes not used for two years in a row. But um, of course. I would uh, say the private water users uh, that have bought uh, their, their titles for a lot of money on the market, even if it's an illegal market, they, uh, they perceive their water titles as a private property. So um, with the help of lawyers, they've been able to resist such a cancellation of rights um, versus uh, Con Agua. And uh, Con Agua, the state, uh, has solved this conflict by introducing so-called guarantee quotas, to, uh, which allow the user to pay a fee for the volumes uh, they, are, uh, they, they don't use. Um, so in this way, the, uh, the unused volumes are made available for commercialization on the black market instead of for the restoration of the aquifer. Uh, second, uh, what are the implications of this illegal water rights market? Um, these, um, these, these structures have led to a quite uh, ironic outcome regarding the further incentives for regularization of water rights, which is actually quite alarming. Mexico has in the last years been undergoing a process of further regularization of groundwater extraction. So in an act of emergency, uh, President Peña Nieto announced the abolishment of all free access zones in Mexico on the International Water Day in 2013. This means that the whole country is now a declared a prohibition zone where wells are being regularized and the drilling of wells is forbidden without permission from Conagua. And in existing prohibition zones, there's an increasing monitoring of wells going on. On the discursive side, this is uh, legitimized uh, with water being an issue of national security that requires new and uh, prompt solutions. It's considered a shift from a reactive to a proactive, uh, preventive approach, which will finally reduce the overexploitation of groundwater. Uh, apart from this rational planning uh, for national security explanation, there's also an alternative reading, which is suggested by this statement by a retired senior official from Conagua that I'm, um, I'm going to read to you because it's quite revealing. Last year, on the International Water Day, the, the Peña Nieto government released a decree. It established Zona de Veda in the whole country. So the market will continue in the same way. I asked, in the whole country? But the Zona de Veda status depends on the availability of water, doesn't it? There are new studies of availability. It's not allowed to drill wells anymore. But is the information in these studies correct? 
not even the public register is correct. It's for putting numbers. There are very strong economic interests behind it and political interests as well. It's very much money, including that people of the government, state and federal government, have concessions of millions of cubic meters. I know of someone that had four million cubic meters. It is a lot. Two of these were sold to a housing company. I'd like to know how we got them. Later, in the uh, CNA, which is uh, Konawa, the director, his brother also did not have concessions before. Later, he did. I asked, is there really water scarcity? In zones, yes. In Torreon, Chihuahua, in the north of the country, there's a lot of scarcity. And in the center, here, yes, there is. Uh, so he's referring to the federal district, Mexico City. Because if not, the government of the federal district did not have the necessity of transferring it here. You're probably aware of this huge water transfer scheme that transfers all the water uh, to Mexico City from the outside. What about the Valley of Toluca? There it is another situation. The water is, yes, there's availability. Just that they have restricted it with the Veda. I think that, yes, there's water. First of all, in the Valley of Toluca, all these more serious studies, I think that yes, there's availability, but it's a very complex formula to measure availability. It seems that, I say, it seems that it's not so important whether there is or there isn't water. He says, this is the key point. The issue is of cultural, political and economic kind. Water bears all these situations. So, um, I can't, uh, of course, verify this, uh, but I think that considering uh, the powerful interests associated with water rights trading, I would say it's at least doubtful whether ecological sustainability is the only incentive for the stricter regularization of groundwater extraction in Mexico. And I think uh, it's quite paradox that the establishment of good water governance uh, in the sense of a strict uh, enforcement of this 1992 water law reform under the present conditions would result not in eco ecological sustainability, but in a more tightly organized illegal water market in which money determines access to water. So in other words, the strict regularization uh, would result in a de facto privatization of water resources, even if they are legally a common good. Before I... Um, I conclude, um, I'd like to share a few insights with you that I gained over the last year doing desk research about the broader state of the Mexican economy. And um, what I want to emphasize here is that the securitization of housing is only one manifestation of um, the financialization of the Mexican economy at large. And the main point here is that because of the financialization of the Mexican economy, that is uh, mainly a, a monetary uh, policy made for financial investors and not for uh, the, the domestic economy, there's a massive outflow of uh, financial resources from Mexico that has to be countered with increasing exports and foreign uh, direct um, investment, foreign uh, portfolio investment. And this has consequences for how water uh, is allocated. So I made this uh, nice uh, graph uh, of the Mexican uh, current account. I can't go into detail. I've, I've written all of this up uh, also in another paper that's just um, under review and that I hope to publish soon. But um, I still um, yeah, want to mention the key points um, to you. So there have been increasing outflows of money from the national economy. There's a massive current account deficit that's been increasing over the years. Uh, this is the uh, blue uh, turquoise um, uh, line you, you see here. And you also see that the situation is quite bad at the moment. It's actually worse than during the 1995 uh, crisis. And the main reason for this is uh, the, the green column, which is called, uh, for those who are not economists, and I'm not an economist myself, so I had to uh, study all this. Uh, this is called a net primary income. Um, this is uh, basically two things, it's interest and dividends. Um, and um, so, so first, so why are there so many uh, interests and dividends paid uh, abroad from Mexico? Um, the, the first thing uh, is about interest. 
the Mexican state has to pay more and more interest abroad because due to um, uh, reforms that were induced by the IMF in the 1990s regarding the monetary system, uh, it finances itself uh, through government bonds issued on the international financial market. So um, in the uh, 2017 budget, the amount that Mexico spends on interest, uh, on the payment of interest abroad is larger than what is spent for the budgets of, of the sectors of health, education and social services altogether. Second, regarding the dividends, um, a main feature of uh, financialized countries in the, in the periphery is high interest rates to attract the, uh, the uh, in investors um, on the international market to their bonds. And these high interest rates, among other things, have led to a far-reaching uh, destruction of the domestic economy. That is uh, because uh, domestic firms, smaller firms, do not have access uh, to cheaper funding um, abroad. So uh, this means that, uh, first of all, there's been a, a concentration of transnational uh, corporations, uh, the consolidation um, of, of the power of these transnational uh, corporations that, of course, um, take their profit out of the country. Uh, and also uh, where Mexican companies were able to compete with these transnational companies, um, they, uh, they went, underwent a process of transnationalization themselves because um, what they do is they don't uh, fund themselves through uh, banks, domestic banks anymore because of the high interest rates. Instead, they issue bonds uh, on international financial markets. Um, so um, that's, that's uh, cheaper uh, to fund um, their activities. And the consequence of this is that uh, Mexico uh, does not also have to pay more and more interest abroad, but also dividends uh, for firms. Um, and uh, yeah, why is this relevant in this context? Uh, because to counter this massive uh, and increasing outflows of money in the balance of payments, money has to come in. How can it come in? One way is, uh, you see the uh, purple one, it's, it's the migrant remittances. So just to underline uh, how important that is uh, for the Mexican economy. But um, yeah, obviously it's not enough. Um, so how can it come in? Uh, one way is uh, to increase the debt, which is something that is happening. The debt um, yeah, stands at crazy amounts at the moment, at crazy levels. Um, and of course, this also reinforces the whole problem of, of the interest payments. And another way, um, of uh, countering uh, this, this situation's negative current account situation uh, is to attract uh, more uh, foreign direct investment and, and portfolio investment um, and the securitization of housing and of other public infrastructure and services is one way uh, to do so. Um, another way uh, is uh, to further increase the exports um, the um, exports have that you can't really see that in, uh, in this uh, in this graph because um, the trade balance is the blue one. Uh, you can see that it's negative, uh, but you can't see the vo volume of trade. And the volume of trade has also massively increased since the 1990s. Um, the exports have massively increased, but the problem is that the imports have increased even more. Um, so. Um, the uh, exports have to be increased not only to pay uh, for the increasing imports, but also to counter uh, the, the negative current account situation. And um, in consequence, the Mexican government further pushes uh, industrialization. Uh, the, the main uh, demand for water rights at the moment in Toluca also comes from the industry because there are so many new industrial parks uh, being set up. Uh, so the housing industry is actually quite um, bad at the moment, obviously, um, after the crash in 2013. Um, and it's mainly the industry that buys, um, buys water titles at the moment. Um, yeah, indus industrialization not only in uh, manufacturing, but also in agriculture. Um, so Mexican state, Mexican government pushes all forms of extractivism, as it's been um, called lately in the literature. And um, the thing is that um, in a country that is largely arid or semi-arid, 
uh, especially in the north and the center, where the bulk of economic activities is concentrated. Um, it's clear that all of this has consequences in terms of water. The new industrial plants need water, um, uh, they need energy. Uh, energy is a big issue in Mexico at the moment. Uh, that is supposed to, and there's also, uh, there was the energy reform uh, two years ago um, in, in this uh, context. Uh, the energy is supposed to come from new dams uh, and also from exploiting hydrocarbons through fr fracking, which uh, also uses crazy amounts of water. Uh, what I want to say uh, is that under the current conditions, I see the danger that available water resources are allocated ultimately to serve the needs of finance capital. And if this works through informal markets, this uh, may also be to the advantage of the political elite, not only because they benefit themselves from uh, trading on this market, but also because this reallocation of water rights takes place behind closed doors and without public notice in the end. So to conclude, um, housing policy, um, is uh, one of the policies in Mexico that has been adapted to serve the needs of transnational finance capital. In essence, it's not a social policy, but it's a mechanism to redistribute wealth from the working class to global finance capital through the mechanism of interest. Even so, um, I uh, would, would say that the case has shown that it's not only a simple story of wealth distribution from local to global, but uh, there are also uh, local actors that benefit from these modes, uh, new modes of accumulation. And these are, in this case, the actors that manage and control the resources that are necessary for the materialization of, of this um, um, accumulation mode um, through home building. And in Toluca, we've seen that it's especially those actors that uh, possess and determine access to water rights that have been able to benefit from this story. So, um, Financialization does not uh, materialize by itself, but it must be made happen by actors and through resources on the ground as well. Second, um, how can we think about the commodification of natural resources under finance led accumulation? Um, the housing projects come into being only through an existing water governance regime with their specific hydrological conditions their legal frameworks and the local networks of actors. But at the same time, these, um, um, these housing projects, um, this, this housing uh, sector has also led to a new structure of groundwater governance in uh, Mexico. And uh, this may have profound implications for uh, the access to water rights and culminates in the potential uh, privatization of physical water resources. What this shows is that the commodification of natural resources under neoliberal capitalism may proceed through more complex routes than direct resource grabbing. In this case, I think Moore's web of life um, could be a neat concept to designate the complexity of the interaction of natural resources regimes with the financialized economy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nadine. That was an extremely rich talk uh, with a lot of lot in it. So uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of interesting uh, uh, questions uh, to think about this further and to expand the argument and detail and fill it in whatever you like. I mean, I like the, as a water scholar, I like the paradox of a regulatory regime de facto producing privatization, which is hardly observable to the general public because it happens somewhere else. That is the, but of course also the, the, I think analytically the linkage between water resources, housing, financialization, national and global capital, I think that's also quite interesting, the implications for sustainability. So there are many, many issues here that could be addressed. The floor is open to, for you to comment and question and ask the details and clarifications. Please say your name when you speak. Uh, yes, um, yes, so Mike. Um, are there any social movements that are actually aware that 
poorer people through this housing um, situation are being used to financialize things far beyond them? And are they aware of that, the ordinary people? Or are they completely unaware of it? Um, there is uh, yeah, something, I'm not sure if I would call it social movement. Um, there's one person I also talked to, to him. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's basically that's the thing. It's, it's one person. Um, he's been fighting this out uh, for uh, more, not so much the Infonavit housing, uh, but because I think he was also um, had, had problems uh, himself also in this whole story, um, and he's um, yeah become this kind of social activist, uh, gathering the people and fighting it out in front of the national court and everything. Um, but, um, yeah, actually they put him in jail um, yeah. two years ago. Uh, he was in jail for a year. They put him in jail because they said he stole a mobile phone. Um, and, um, yeah, that's about the story. So that's critical. Yeah, newspaper, La, La Jornada, they report about that. But I'm not aware of any other um, social so it's, awareness. It's happening without people basically knowing what's going on. Thank you. Yeah. Please say your name. So I found your presentation very interesting and I found one of the things you said that and you concluded and you said that financialization of housing has led to these systems of being in the real market. So So I was wondering if you could speak a bit about uh, other factors that might have contributed to the existence of the world market. It seems like it's just, it appears like it's just this big factor that's led to the rise and because that always seems to be what it is in it, where there are these easy to work markets that exist and there are other easy to work markets. So, mm -hmm. I'd be very interested in how you come to that. Yeah, I think it's a very good point. I mean, that's a point I've been thinking about a lot, uh, of course. Um, I think that. It's also been, I mean, it's also, it was also this coincidence of um, it ha both happening at the same time, this regularization of water rights and the financialization. And I mean, to an extent, it's not so much a coincidence because it's part of the same uh, yeah, neoliberal um, policy ideology that's, that's behind both things. Um, but I would say that yeah, it's it's the it was in this case uh, the main reason because because of the demand because it was was what pushed the demand um, so much for water rights. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. Well, I'm Andy Newsham. I'm, uh, I'm an academic in the Centre for Development and Environmental Policy here at Stars. A um, couple of questions. When you say Coyote, uh, when, when you say Coyote. Oh, no. Sorry, in Argentine Spanish, it's because you're um, <laughs> I forget sometimes. Um, sometimes that word has different meanings. Um, sometimes it's associated with other illicit legal activities, such as drugs and you know other kind of mm -hmm. stuff that you don't have to take through customs, shall we say? And at that famous song, my man Chao had it. Um, I'm just wondering: is are these people who are just Selling water rights, or have they, have they got other stuff going on? Is it just is there are there links that organise crime in other ways? So that's one question. Mm -hmm. um, the other question is, what? Uh, to, just to give a bit of context, um, you talked about all of these private sort of you know formal um, housing developments, but informal housing is probably happening at a greater you know informal settlement construction is probably happening at a greater rate. I, I could be wrong about this. I, haven't been able to find as reliable sources with respect to Mexico as I would like. I'm not a massive specialist in Mexico, I've just done a little bit of research. Mm -hmm. But there's a huge amount of informal construction going on. And um, how does you know how do these questions of water sort of play out in in that regard? And sort of it, to what extent is that the bigger question, the bigger sort of picture when it comes to water access for the poor mm -hmm. people and for the poorest people in Mexico? These are the these housing developments, which I would imagine that if you're able to get access to see credit for a loan, even if it's going to go south pretty quickly, you're not going to be amongst the poorest of the poor. 
So mm -hmm. you can do um, thanks very much um, for these questions. Um, first one, uh, the, the coyote, yeah, that's right. It's a quite widely used term in Mexico. So uh, not only in the water sector, but also in, also in the most famous, uh, of course, the, the ones that smuggle people from uh, Mexico across the border, the ones that uh, you refer to in the, in the song by Manu Chao. Um, uh, but also um, other, yeah, when I found out about this, this story, I asked people about coyote and what it means to them, who is it, a coyote. And it seems that it's something that was much more widespread in the past, that there were a lot of people, for example, in front of, before you could do things online, there were a lot of people in front of um, government buildings, uh, coyotes, that would get you a driver's license and all kinds sure. of intermediary between formal, uh, a lot of, yeah, thing between formal and informal or between the citizen um, and and the state and and these uh, uh, coyotes they are um, yeah they may have I mean it's quite normal that in Mexico many people I would say most people that have money they have different kind of businesses they have like their um, active in different uh, spheres, but um, organized crime, I haven't got across that. I think it's, and, and, and this water business, I know that it's a very big business, so it's, in this case, it would be a main, main business. Uh, the informal housing, that's a very um, interesting question. So thanks for that. Um, because, and that's actually something I wasn't expanding on here because of the time, uh, because one of the things is that when the municipalities ask the real estate developers to uh, bring the water concession for their conjunto that they're constructing, they ask, they, they have this calculation about how many, how many people are going to live there, how much water do they need, there's a standard formula, and they add uh, something on top because uh, there's so much informal housing uh, like informal housing, like people, especially in Mexico, is on ejidos, on the communal mm -hmm. land where people construct houses, mm -hmm. and um, it's uh, from from what I um, found so far, uh, mostly um, it, like not what you would think, um, because these people actually they have quite a lot of uh, leverage against the municipality and against uh, versus the state. So um, once there are enough people. They'd, uh, they'd go to the municipality, they request their water, and then they have elections every three years on the municipal level. So there's a high um, benefit for local politicians to serve these uh, areas with water. And um, so the, what the municipalities do is they ask actually the real estate, because the thing is they can't buy themselves because it's an illegal market, so it's a little tricky to uh, budget for something like that in, the, in an official uh, state agency. Right, so um, they ask the developers to bring them uh, these additional water rights that they need to serve these um, colonies, which I think is quite absurd um, as well, that the state and local state itself sources water rights through illegal um, markets. Sure, I, I guess I'm just, maybe I missed it in your answer, oh. I'm just trying to get a sense of relatively Water access uh, as mediated through these private developments is clearly, you know, there's really crazy what's going on, and that's a very powerful message from your research. I'm just trying to categorize it in terms of people getting access to water, mm -hmm. and if most people, or if more people, especially poor people, are living in formal settlements, how big a phenomenon is this nationally? If what you know, these 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 developments, <coughs> these formal developments, what proportion of you know the national sort of um, you know, settlement construction, if you, if you include informal settlements in that, mm -hmm. is it so that we can get a picture of it? It's very big or it's actually just a relatively small. You mean in terms of uh, space or area or? Well, people, volumes of water. I don't know how much volume of water people get from informal settlements. Uh, volumes of, of water, I wouldn't know. But, but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, spatially, it's surely a lot less, a lot less than, than all the, the Ejido settlements that are, yeah, huge, if you see on Google Maps, um, they're huge. So um, the conjuntos, there are just little spots between that. And in terms of water, I couldn't say, really. It's, it's hard to tell because 
yeah, I, it would be great to have the data also about water availability and so on. I mean, I know there are a lot of zones in informal settlements where people only have water a few hours per day and so on. But um, yeah, it's always difficult to establish direct causal relationships between one and the other. Sure. Yeah. So I hope that Someone the question. <laughs> yes. Oh, and but uh, just to um, mention, because you, you you were saying that they're not the poorest of the poor. Mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Uh, maybe they're not the poorest of the poor in the sense that they are formally employed. But if you see what it means to be formally employed, it doesn't mean much uh, in Mexico. They have this, the minimum wage is like um, yeah the lowest of all. Um, even in Latin America, the lowest. Uh, it's not. It's, it's even in Mexico below the poverty line, below the national poverty line. So, um, yeah, it's also. I would say it's also largely what we consider poor people um, that dream, yeah, fulfilling their dream and buying a house in these colonies. Mm -hmm. I'm going to answer next to public answer yeah, then just a few comments or questions uh, which build on the diagram that you showed at the very beginning of the financial scheme of the order that could be helpful just to pull it back there. Uh, yeah, because in fact it quite nicely shows the role of the international investors led to fewer both demand and supply on the one hand yeah. and the other one. You, you nicely show there on the left how to fill the demand side and they get on the right the, the, the supply side of this housing. And then what comes to my mind is that on the left you find like a, a public private partnership scheme where you have a joint financial contribution of the public sources of finance and the private ones. What comes to my mind is that the typical in PPP schemes, if the PPP does not really work, it is the public sector side which provides guarantees to uh, provide the expected return of investment to the private sector, which means that incidentally it is also taxpayers which are going to lose uh, out of the scheme. So who is not, that? Who is going to lose? Which are uh, consequentially also taxpayers oh, yeah. are to be called yeah. to contribute yeah. to, this, to the scheme as a more obscure losers uh, within the, this framework. And uh, another comment or question is that uh, on the supply side, I just think that if, the, if there could be there also someone more to gain out of this uh, scheme, which could be speculation out of increased value of land, for example, mm -hmm. and that as well there are also possibly some cause of this, because uh, as you described uh, when there was the housing crash, mm -hmm. possibly also some real estate companies uh, found themselves into, into trouble. Yeah, yeah. And so it just comes to my mind how the spreading of gains and losses extend also to taxpayers. Uh, and the speculators of land and the real estate yeah. companies. Yeah, and I mean, Where you collect the evidence also from these other stakeholders. Yeah, yeah, that's very, yeah. I've, I've tried actually, um, I've tried to dig more into that. Also, the, the companies that, um, that there are these four companies that, or three companies that went, went bankrupt and it's quite difficult to get. I mean, there's still talk in Mexico about that they're going to bail them out. Somehow, and they apparently they got money um, from the state again, also to save these companies because they have so many houses. And um, but um, yeah, it's quite uh, difficult to get the data. And then when I was there last time, my focus was uh, was not on this, but on the on the land issues with the farmers and so on. So then it's also always a time constraint as one person to follow up. Um, and that is, there's so many things to follow up in this. Um, yeah. But I mean, I'm sure that, I'm quite sure that the people that own these companies probably themselves, they didn't lose so much money, I would imagine. The banks actually lost. The banks that uh, invested directly in the supply side, that they invested directly in the companies, um, they, they lost uh, at least what it looks like, but what's been going on behind closed doors, um, yeah, who knows. <laughs> and actually after this, oh, I, I keep thinking more and more stuff, because after 2013, the, uh, this was before 2013, right, this graph, that the federal mortgage company only uh, uh, insured the um, demand side 
-hmm. And now it's also the supply side. So they also, um, it also serves as intermediary between the direct the real estate developers and the financial market. It was like that before. So they pushed a lot of more money in that, in, into this um, whole thing uh, after 2013 to encourage the market again. Wonderful business. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. I was just wondering in some of the broader ecological sustainability zone paradigm, because scarcity, regularization of groundwater seems to, I mean, that's one of the logics, you know, sort of for regularization of the scarcity, so we need to manage this better. Um, one of the inputs into construction of this housing is obviously groundwater. Uh, going into the construction processes. And I say this from experience in India, mm -hmm. where in the last few years, there's been a lot of focus on how to get builders and developers to use recycled water instead of using sort of pure groundwater, extracting groundwater, mm -hmm. um, because of impacts from the quantity side and also from the qualitative side. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering whether, from an ecological sustainability perspective, whether there is any strength in environmental laws in Mexico any demand for such laws or regulation, and also whether there's a market for recycled water, because that is also something which is emerging, not just pure water, but also mm. recycled water. Mm -hmm. Whether you saw any of that in Mexico? Mm. In yeah, I did actually. It's an interesting point. In uh, two ways. One is that the Infonavit, they are now, um, well, displaying themselves as a yeah, green uh, kind of, yeah, green uh, aid agency. Um, and they have things like uh, yeah, rainwater harvesting and so on in these new uh, colonies that they construct or in the new buildings. Although um, they gave me a presentation about this. Um, I haven't done research about it, I don't know. Uh, GTZ, the GIZ, the German Development Corporation, is actually involved in that, financing it. I don't know to which extent it's working or uh, successful. And water recycling is also happening, but it's in the industry. Um, and that was also, it must also be further now. I should also have a look into that again when I'm there next time, uh, because they've started about uh, three years ago, I think, um, establishing a, um, a, among the industry, um, a water yeah, recycling um, a plant uh, where uh, industry can buy uh, water from this plant uh, for cheaper, of course, than from uh, what they have to pay to Conagua for, for groundwater. And so that's something that was a, a complete private initiative by all the companies, uh, the industrial parks uh, in, the, in this area. Um, yeah, the state had nothing to do with it. So that's also quite interesting, I think. But I don't know how far it's now, if it's actually working now. And just to follow up, what's happening to wastewater that comes out of the housing colonies? Because they, there's not a lot of water consumption in, in, that, in domestic use, so most of it must go back to the environment in some form or another. How much of that is recycled? Is, is that the recharge of the aquifers, or is it the, the pollution of the rivers that go to the sea, or what, what's happening with that? It's water? mostly on the outside, it's mostly canals, uh, rivers. Uh, it goes in the, in the river Lerma. It's yeah. a river. It's, um, there's very few. Uh, there is very few wastewater treatment plants, uh, especially in the public. Um, the private companies, that the big ones, uh, the transnational ones, they have their own plants because of um, of image and so on to the outside. Um, but the, the public, the municipalities, there's very few plants and working uh, plants in the area. So, so a lot of the goes water, the wastewater actually leaves the valley through the river. Yeah, it leaves the valley. It goes to the La uh, Laguna Chapala and uh, to the Pacific. Yeah. Okay, Richard. Yeah, I'm Richard Atsby. I teach on the uh, political ecology of development course here at SAS. Um, and I've also done some work on labor contractors in, in India. So I'm sort of interested in, in that aspect and going back to Andy's question about the communities. Um, and uh, you mentioned sort of social networks and social capital, um, and I, I assume that when you know you've you've met and interviewed uh, many of these people, do you get a sense of 
of, of sort of their careers, what they did, you know, before, how you become a KOT over time, you know, were they working for the state, do they have relatives that work for the state, you know, how do they gain that sort of knowledge? Um, and, 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 you know, related to that, do they have links with, um, for instance, politicians? Mm -hmm. Is that how they achieve what they do? They're not simply um, a bridge between you know, buyers and sellers, but they're able to do that because they have uh, political connections. Um, and, and, you know, the second part of the question is what makes good KOT? You mm -hmm. know, how are you successful in that? How do you present yourselves? Uh, both to, um, you know, the, the, the bureaucrats, uh, the mm -hmm. people that are selling. I mean, how, how do people become aware of a KOT? Um, and they're not just presenting themselves to those two, two yeah. buyers and sellers, but also presenting the results of the transaction between them. Yeah. Yeah. So the actual finals. How do they present that? Well? Yeah, exactly. So that's um, yeah, it's presented as a very formal uh, and uh, legal, not not illegal. Uh, that's uh, that's the point. It's not illegal <laughs> because it's not stated anywhere in the law that it's illegal. It's not allowed. Um, and uh, I think the most important is because there's been a lot of problems apparently with fake titles. Uh, so, um, it's the trust, yeah, so that's, it's a recommendation uh, for people and it's a very yeah, serious, um, like a consultant, like a consultant, it's, Can you guess it's not so much, it's just kind of, <laughs> yeah, because on the one hand people call it the black market and the coyotes, but um, on the other hand it's also something very established, it seems like it's something yeah, totally normal and um, yeah, and and um, of course, uh, what you need is good relationships to Conagua. That's the first uh, thing. That's the most important thing because you need the trust to people there that you don't um, um, yeah because you give them money. You know, it's like yeah. it's also a corrupt uh, business. Uh, so um, yeah, you need a lot of. And, and you need a lot of legal expertise because for one of these transactions, it's like this uh, big of uh, uh, document, folder document you have to submit to Conagua with all the necessary studies and technical details, environmental uh, assessment, and so on. And also, there are cases where, where the police will investigate. Who would investigate these this, these acts of corruption? Um, does that you know? Does that happen often, or who who would be responsible? It for happened. Um, I guess it's mostly if it happens related to political um, rivalries. So the rival, opposition politicians. Yeah, sorts. I think it's yeah. mostly that because it happened that they fired people. Um, right. They fired uh, the director okay. uh, and the di sub director of uh, legal uh, issues or something a few years ago. Um, they were involved, that's in this water alternatives paper, but they, they um, there was this uh, big company, uh, was Coca-Cola actually, and they had a concession for 40,000 um, cubic meters and they used 840,000 people, uh, cubic meters, and they, um, yeah, they, they paid the money to, to them, so they let it happen, and that's something they exposed. But, oh, of course, the Coca-Cola was not exposed, but these people were fired. And later, yeah, I don't know, anti-corruption, it's very big uh, officially, but informally, I guess, in most, like in most areas, it still, yeah, persists. Yeah. And the bio, have, do you have examples of the biographies of these people? What kind of people are coyotes? Or yeah, people that used to work at Conagua themselves before. Right. Yeah. Mm. Or people for yeah, just have a good sense of business um, and yeah, just um, yeah, know they've known these people for a long time, have done business with them. Um, yeah, it's I, I don't think it's possible to because there's not many of them. It's very few um, that control this market, and yeah, it's it's not easy to enter the market and become a coyote. I think because of that. Because you need the trust first of all, mm. so from people and his recommendations. Because it's something a little tricky, especially for all the industry, the foreign companies, and so on. Um, something, yeah, you don't you don't like to be involved with, but you have to. So you need someone that you really know manages the stuff in a good way, and it's all mm. ca taken care of in a good way. Nice.
Um, is there something? <coughs> so say, oh, I'm afraid, I'm mm -hmm. um, is there something stopping the um, government from legalizing the trade of uh, these rules concessions in, uh, in order to regulate the tax? Yeah, I guess it's the um, idea that water is a common good. And that's something so that's it's, it's, it's legitimacy um, factor that there'd be a huge, uh, because it is something that um, brings people together in, in Mexico. Water is an issue. There are um, social movements and so on around that. So I guess, yeah, if you say that you reprivatize, but I mean, most people, they don't know about this um, illegal market. So only people that are involved in the, in the housing sector or in the industry, industrial parks, and so of course everyone knows, and the farmers, but normal people um, don't know about this. That's also why I'm saying it's also the danger of it and the nice thing for politicians also because it's this reallocation of rights is really completely under the table. I mean, you could find out about it uh, looking into all the Excel data or whatever is online about the, who has the concessions and so on, but who does that? And you were. There, there was one yeah. 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 question. Yeah. Um, to start with that, um, that's also, of course, I'm almost inclined to say, um, yeah, people, it started apparently also during the Fox government from 2000 um, mm -hmm. because uh, of personal uh, connections, um, yeah, that uh, to the construction industry, to one of these uh, firms mm -hmm. that, um, yeah, policy was also made a little bit in favor um, of these of these people's um, companies. So the, the political elite itself is very much um, involved in this. Um, not only in housing, also in further infrastructure. I also looked into like highway projects, and mm -hmm. it's also it's really bad. Yeah, and um, and the World Bank. Were you referring to the housing or to the water? Because I mean they're involved in both. So I guess both, but kind of like if there's going to be privatization of water happening soon, that's kind of Leading towards, yeah, models that World Bank is kind of thinking about. Um, I I'm not aware that the the World Bank pushes for privatization of this. Yeah, no, I'm not not aware of that. I mean, there's also a difference between privatization of water resources and water supply. Okay. Um, and um, well, both is officially. Uh, State, uh, state of state service in Mexico, and it would be problematic, I think, to, to privatize it in terms of social resistance. There's strong uh, resistance in terms of water. And it would also be interesting to look at the uh, the personal relations, the kind of careers of some of the Mexican senior water officials in relation to the World Bank. And one of the former heads of Conagua has been. The senior irrigation advisor of the World Bank for that period of time. So you would also have to look at. Uh, so Mexico is very well present in, or was I don't know for recent years, but previously Mexico was very well present in debates within the bank on water, as Egypt was for that matter. <laughs> so yeah. 
Uh, and you also built that, yeah. Hi. I said a quick, hi, my name is Jack, sorry. Um, I just had a question about the license holders and the title holders um, who, I guess, found themselves sitting in the gold mines and uh, having the title. Mm -hmm. Who are they? Are there, are there any examples of small scale title holders who make lots of money through this and how do they benefit? Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not aware that there are any. Um, that's one of the questions. Um, also, yeah, we'd need more time again to, to do research about it. For example, the Ejidos, the whole communal land, um, they also had water titles for irrigation. And, but yeah, it's, it's also difficult to find out. I guess we also need, would need to be lucky to find out mm -hmm. because the stuff that happened in the past, the, um, how do you say, the presidents of the Ejidos, they had changed, they changed like every two years or something. So, um, and there's a lot of corruption going on in there as well. So there have been stories of um, Ejido presidents, for example, selling uh, their water rights of their whole communal, communal Ejido. Um, and of course, without the people knowing about this, but I don't have any, any hard data about it. Yeah. And at the moment, it's mostly the, now it's mostly the industry that's trading the rights. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Any other comments or questions? Well, I mean, this very interesting question about the whole financial and financial edition. My name is Brian, I'm a student at SOAS. Because it, it, to some extent, the, the, for example, the carbon financing mechanism is expected to benefit the uh, farmers and the uh, small uh, farming house projects. So in this case, whether these communities are large or individual farmers are benefiting from this whole process. So how is the, the advantages in that process as well? And this could be a very, very interesting question to take, whether these communities are really benefiting from the whole financial model, this one. The farmers? You mean? The farmers, the community, uh, mm -hmm. Numbers, for instance, if the land or the water is owned by the whole of the entire village, the community. So, I mean, it's very interesting because whether this kind of financial addition model is benefiting these communities as well. You mean the water? Financialization yeah, of the yeah, water? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so uh, the question, yeah, I mean, it's, it's related to the same yeah, so point, yeah. right? Like, who were the ones that, that sold or that, that, that were able to sell or are able to sell water rights. And I think first of all, the big land holdings under irrigation, they were the big farmers. Um, so these were the, the, the first ones benefiting, also in terms of land, because these were also the ones that sold their land uh, for the construction of, the, of these uh, colonies. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of, of the water, I haven't heard of a case where really an ejido as a total, I mean, they have hundreds of people usually. So and they, they sold their water rights and, and profited from that. And I, yeah, I doubt it you know, that it happened. And mostly it's not irrigated land anyway. In this, so there are, have been some, but more uh, surface water, I think. There have been some with groundwater but um, I don't think it's the, it's the majority of the Ejidos. But it's something really, it's more speculative because I haven't had the time to look into it. And it'd be quite difficult also because you'd have to go with the list of all the concessions, with the list of all the titles, you'd have to go through around. I mean, this is also a huge area. So it's like hundreds of titles, hundreds of wells. You have to go and look and ask people what happened to the rights and so on. So, yeah, it'd be a bigger project to do it. A nice one, but... you wanted to come back. Yeah, I was actually wondering, actually, quite curious to know that how does the media respond to uh, the EU water markets in Mexico, especially if they're used to call it and give it as an then like you do the EU. Yeah, I haven't seen any media reports about it. And anywhere in Mexico where I uh, where I presented it or talked to people, no one knew about it. 
So, yeah, the media. <laughs> it's depressing. Yeah, the media is not working very well. I would say from a, from my outsider perspective. Is it? Hi, uh, my name is Lee. I teach at Source. Um, this is a very, very brief comment. Uh, totally enjoyed the presentation. Um, I just reflected on the rules of the community and uh, the people have asked a lot of questions about and the fact that he said um, those people are not operating illegal business. So there's no way in the law I specified what they're doing is illegal. So thinking I'd be trying to look at um, a very clear topology between what's formal, what's legal, what's illegal, what's informal. So this crossover between legality and informality, informality and legality, is that something that you try to clarify? How can we see the coyotes within this topology? So are they more informal, legal, um, illegal, formal? No. I can't speak. Yeah, it's a tricky question because, I mean, what is, of course, legal and that's how they sell themselves. Is there consultants? Water consultants? Um, they facilitate water rights transmissions. Nothing is illegal about that. It's just illegal to take money uh, for it, I mean, for to sell the water right itself. And that's the thing that is, um, yeah, that is not, um, not formal and that is, um, yeah. But I don't know if there are. Um, do what you you were asking about my personal opinion about whether it's illegal yeah. or should we should call it illegal? No, or? not necessarily that you make a judgment on it. Just mm -hmm. a description, which is what we just uh, oh, scale okay. us that yeah. okay, they are legal or informal. Um, <clears throat> just to be clear. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, everyone knows, obviously. Still, it's a kind of illegal. Otherwise, they wouldn't call it the black market, right? And the money transaction part of it is definitely illegal. the money. Yeah. Yeah, it's illegal, but yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like the the kind of transfer process in India, where politicians formally have a say. There are committees for arranging the transfers of government officials every three years. That's, that's all formalized. It's all in principle okay, but then of course it's not legal. That there's a, there's a whole market for public office beneath that, or part of it rather, uh, and that's the illegal part. Yeah. So yeah, there's yeah, and the broker I think has the capacity to move in both worlds, and exactly because it is united in one person, there is no contradiction, or everybody. Nobody has to experience the contradiction because you concentrate it in one point in someone who's willing to make a business out of that capacity. So I think that is a wonderful way. Yeah. Yeah. Any other? Well, we do that in many ways also. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's what we call it. We call this for uh, carrying transaction costs, well, it is, isn't it? Um, very cool. Any other close last comments before we are bit of perhaps you know, the just fi public finance actually. <laughs> exactly. Just one last comment that brings to my mind how they can compenetrate with each other such an informal arrangement of the broker role, yeah. which plays quite an important function for oil as mm -hmm. a mechanism with a very formal, intricate with the financial system where we are really two different worlds coming side by side to each other. And the, the first is certainly the second one, because if you think of a perspective of, of a rational investor here, I'm not going to put my money into a house if I'm not safe that the water will be supplied to this house. And so just to rely that there is a, an informal mechanism that in many cases will ensure that water will arrive to the house. Yeah. And you own pay consultancy fee. It's a very smart insight. Yeah. Okay. Any other things? You're welcome to chat informally uh, after this. Uh, we are going to announce the next seminars. First, next week's seminar. Yes. Uh, next week's seminar will be right here at the same time by delivered by uh, uh, 
uh, it's always interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're talking about neoliberalization and sort of debates around performativity and how markets are constructed. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I look forward to that person because it's sort of my own domain also. So you're all welcome to talk. And the third episode of the water series uh, will be on the 22nd of February, I think, if that is a Wednesday. Uh, uh, in three weeks, at least. It must be because today is the first. Uh, and it is Antonio Joris, he, who is in Cardiff and works on water in cities in that Latin America as well. So there is a, a kind of a sort of a connection here that uh, emerged. Uh, through that invitation, so, but I think his work is more also southern, more southern classic. But I know he has lots of work in Mexico as well. So please come again, because that I uh, connect. And then on the 8th of March, we will have Nicholas Milgaard from Corner House, again talking about infrastructure and financialization in a broader sense, including water. So somehow that has become the thing of this the water series. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Nadine, particularly very much for this excellent presentation. Thank you. <laughs> and we hope to see you back after some time with all the 25 remaining topics. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and see you. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes? Yeah, if you want, we're done for a yeah, I'm taking.